Chapter 21 The Decline of Superior Races The modern world is far from being threatened by the danger of underpopulation. The cry of alarm some political leaders have launched in the past with the absurd slogan, There is power in numbers, is totally unfounded. The truth is that we are facing an opposite danger, the constant and entrammeled increase of population in purely quantitative terms. The deterioration of the population affects only those stocks that should be considered the bearers of the forces that preside over the demos and the world of the masses and that contribute to any authentic human greatness. When I criticize the racist world via mention that occult power when present, alive and at work constitutes the principle of a superior generation that reacts on the world of quantity by bestowing upon it a form and quality. In this regard, one can say that the superior Western races have been agonizing for many centuries and that the increasing growth in world population has the same meaning as the swarming of worms on a decomposing organism or as the spreading of cancer cells. Cancer is an uncontrolled hypertrophy of a plasma that devours the normal, differentiated structures of an organism after subtracting itself from the organism's regulating laws. This is the scenario facing the modern world, the regression and the decline of fecunditing. In the higher sense of the term, forces and the forces that bear forms parallels the unlimited proliferation of matter, of what is formless, of the masses. This phenomenon must be related to what I have mentioned in the previous chapter concerning the sexes and concerning the relationship between men and women in this day and age, since they affect the issue of procreation and its meaning. If it is true that the modern world seems destined not to know any longer what the absolute woman and the absolute man are all about, and if in this world the sexualization is incomplete, that is, limited to the quarry plane, then it must seem natural that the superior and even transcendent dimensions of sex, known by the world of tradition in multiple forms, have been lost, and that this loss may affect the regimen of sexual unions and the possibilities offered by them either as a pure erotic experience or in view of a procreation that may not exhaust itself in a simple, opaque biological event. The world of tradition effectively knew a sexual send and magic of sex. What constantly transpires in countless symbols and customs from all parts of the world is the acknowledgement of sex as a creative and primordial force, rather than as a generative power. In the woman, abyssal powers of passion and light, of danger and disintegration, were evoked. The thontic power, namely, the earth, lived in her while heaven lived in man. Everything that is experienced by ordinary men in the form of peripheral sensations and passional and corporeal impulses was assumed in an organic and conscious way. Generation was decreed and the being who was generated was willed as the child of duty, namely, as one who must undertake and nurse the supernatural element of his stock and the liberation of the ancestor, and who must receive and pass on to future generations strength, life, and stability. Today, all this has become an inane fancy, and, instead of being in control of sex, are controlled by it and wander about like drunkards without having the least clue as to what takes place in the course of their embraces, and without seeing the guiding principle acting behind their quest for pleasure or behind their own passions. Without people being aware of any of this, beyond and often against their own will, what comes into existence as a result of their intercourse is a new being who will have no spiritual continuity and, as in the case of the most recent generations, even without the pale residue constituted by bourgeois effective bonds. This being the case, it is no wonder the superior races are dying out before the ineluctable logic of individualism, which especially in the so-called contemporary higher classes, has caused people to lose all desire to procreate. Not to mention all the other degenerative factors connected to a mechanized and urbanized social life and especially to a civilization that no longer respects the healthy and creative limitations constituted by the castes and by the traditions of blood lineage. Thus proliferation is concentrated in the lower social classes and in the inferior races where the animal-like impulse is stronger than any rational calculation and consideration. The unavoidable effects are reverse selection and the ascent and the onslaught of inferior elements against which the race of the superior caste and people, now exhausted and defeated, can do very little as a spiritually dominating element. Though today people talk more frequently about population control in view of the catastrophic effects of the demographical phenomenon that I have compared to a cancer, this still does not address the essential issue, since a differentiated and qualitative criterion does not come into play at all. But those who oppose population control on the basis of traditionalist and pseudo-moralistic ideas, which nowadays amount to mere prejudices, are guilty of an even greater obtuseness.
If what really matters is the greatness and the might of a stock, it is useless to be concerned about the material quality of father unless an equal concern for its spiritual dimension is present as well in the sense of superior interest, of the correct relationship between the sexes, and above all, of what is really meant by virility, of what it still signifies on a plane that is not merely naturalistic. After exposing the decadence of modern woman, we must not forget that man is mostly responsible for such a decadence. Just like the plebeian masses would have never been able to make their way into all the domains of social life and of civilization if real kings and real aristocrats would have been in power, likewise, in a society run by real men, woman would never have yearned for or even been capable of taking the path he is following today. The periods in which women have reached autonomy and preeminence almost always have coincided with epochs marked by manifest decadence in ancient civilizations. Thus, the best and most authentic reaction against feminism and against every other female aberration should not be aimed at women as such, but at men instead. It should not be expected of women that they return to what they really are and thus reestablish the necessary inner and outer conditions for a reintegration of a superior race, when men themselves retain only the semblance of true virility. If all efforts to reawaken the spiritual dimension of sexuality fail, and if the form of virility is not separated from what has become an amorphous and promiscuous spiritual substance, then everything is in vain. The virility that is physical, phallic, muscular, and animal is lifeless and does not contain any creative germ in the superior sense. Phallic man deceives himself by thinking that he dominates. The truth is that he is passive and is always susceptible to the subtler power of women and to the feminine principle. The differentiation of the sexes is authentic and absolute only in the spirit. In all superior types of tradition, man has always been considered the bearer of the lineage of the Iranian solar principle. This principle transcends the mere blood principle, which is lost as soon as it converges into the feminine lineage. Its development is favored by the fertile ground represented by a pure woman belonging to a higher caste. But in any event, it always remains the qualifying principle that bestows a form and that orders the feminine generating substance. This principle is related to the same supernatural element, to the power that can make the current ascend upward and of which victory, fortune, and prosperity of a particular stock are usually the consequences. Hence the symbolic association, which did not have an obscene, but rather a real and deepening, typical of ancient traditional forms, of the male organ with ideas of resurrection, asceticism, and energies that confer the highest powers. As an echo of superior meanings found even among savage populations, we find expressed in clear terms the idea that only the initiate is a true male, and that initiation marks in an eminent way one's entrance into virility. This means that prior to initiation, the individuals, notwithstanding their physical appearance, have not yet turned into men, and even if they are old, they belong to the same group of children and women and are deprived of all the privileges of the clan's virile elites. When the superbiological element that is the center and the measure of true virility is lost, people can call themselves men, but in reality they are just eunuch and that their paternity simply reflects the quality of animals who, blinded by instinct, procreate randomly other animals, who in turn are mere vestiges of existence. If the expired civilization is propped up so as to make it look alive, and if men are treated like rabbits or stallions, their unions being carefully and rationally planned, let no one be fooled. What they will generate will either be a civilization of very beautiful animals destined to work, or, if the individualistic and utilitarian element predominates, a stronger law will lead the races toward the path of regression or extinction according to the same inexorability of the law of entropy and the degradation of energy. What will then be registered by future historians is only one of the several aspects of the decline of the West that are today very much in evidence. By way of introduction to the second part of this work, let me make a final point that is directly related to what I have previously mentioned concerning the relationships between spiritual virility and devotional religiosity. From these last considerations, what has emerged is that what in the West goes by the name of religion truly corresponds to an essentially feminine orientation. The relationship with the supernatural, conceived in a personalized form, theism, as dedication, devotion, and inner renunciation of one's own will before the divine high presence, the typical traits of the path on which a feminine nature may realize itself. 
Moreover, and, generally speaking, if the feminine element corresponds to the naturalistic element, then it is easy to see why in the world of tradition the inferior castes and races, in which the naturalistic element was more predominant than in those castes and races governed by the power of aristocratic rituals and divine heritage, benefited from the participation in a higher order precisely through relationships of a religious type. Thus, even religion could have a place and exercise its function within the whole hierarchy, though subordinated and relative to higher forms of spiritual realization such as initiation in the various types of higher asceticism. Following the mixing of the castes or of analogous social bodies and the coming to power of the inferior social stratum and races, it was unavoidable that their spirit triumphed even in this regard, that any relationship with the supernatural would be conceived exclusively in terms of religion, that any other higher form came under suspicion and was even stigmatized as sacrilegious and demonic. This feminization of spirituality was already foreshadowed in ancient times. Wherever it prevailed, it determines the first alteration of the primordial tradition in the races. The object of the considerations I will articulate in the second part of my work is to analyze this process of decadence together with all those processes that have led to the collapse of primordial humanity. Through these the genesis and face of the modern world will become manifest. Part 2. Genesis and face of the modern world. Quote, Many things are known by the wise. They foresee many things, the decline of the world and the end of the essays. While a spa... Quote, I reveal to you a secret. The time has come when the groom will crown the bride. But where is the crown? In the north. And whence comes the groom? From the center, where the heat generates the light and turns towards the north, where the light becomes radiant. What are the people living in the south doing? They have fallen asleep in the heat, but they will reawaken in the storm and many among them will be terrified unto death. J. Bameror. Introduction. I would like to point out the difference between the methodology employed in the first part of this work and the methodology adopted in the second part. In the first part, which had a morphological and typological character, I attempted to draw from various testimonies those elements that were more suitable for characterizing, in a universal and meta-historical fashion, the nature of the traditional spirit and the traditional view of the world, of man, and of life. Therefore, I neglected to examine the relationship between the chosen elements and the overall spirit of the different historical traditions to which they belonged. Those elements that in the context of a particular and concrete tradition did not conform to the traditional spirit were considered to be absent and unable to influence the value and the meaning of the rest of the elements. I did not even attempt to determine up to what point certain attitudes in historical institutions had truly been traditional in the spirit rather than just the form. Now my approach is going to be different. I will attempt just to follow the dynamic unfolding of the traditional and anti-traditional forces in history, and therefore it will no longer be possible to apply the same methodology. It will be impossible to isolate and to bring out some particular elements in the complex of various historical civilizations because of their traditional potential. The overall spirit of a given civilization and the way it has concretely utilized all of the elements included in it will now become the relevant and specific object of my discussion. The synthetic consideration of the forces at work will replace my analysis, which had previously isolated the valid elements. I will attempt to discover the dominating factor within the various historical complexes and to determine the value of the different elements, not in an absolute and abstract way, but according to the action they exercised within a given civilization. While so far I have attempted to integrate the historical and particular element with the ideal, universal, and typical element, I will henceforth attempt to integrate the ideal element with the real one. The latter integration, just like the former, more than following the methods and the results of the researches of modern critical historiography, is going to be based mainly on a traditional and metaphysical perspective, on the intuition of a sense that cannot be deduced from the individual elements but that presupposes them, by beginning from this sense it is possible to grasp the different instrumental and organic roles that such elements may have played in various eras of the past and in the different historically conditioned forms. Therefore, it may happen that whatever has been left out in the first integration will become prominent in the second integration, and vice versa. In the framework of a given civilization some elements may be valued and considered to be decisive, while in other civilizations they are present but in the background and deemed to be irrelevant. This warning may be helpful to a certain category of readers. To shift from the consideration of tradition as mahastry to the consideration of tradition as history implies a change of perspectives. It causes the same elements to be valued differently. 
it causes united things to become separated and separated things to unite according to whatever the contingencies of history may determine from case to case. Chapter 22. The Doctrine of the Four Ages Although modern man until recently has viewed and celebrated the meaning of the history known to him as epitomizing progress and evolution, the truth is professed by traditional man is quite the opposite. In all the ancient testimonies of traditional humanity it is possible to find, in various forms, the idea of a regression or a fall, from originally higher state beings have stooped to states increasingly conditioned by human, mortal, and contingent elements. This involutive process allegedly began in a very distant past. The term that best characterizes it is the editor Megaraka, the twilight of the gods. In the traditional world this teaching was not expressed in a vague and generic form, but rather was articulated in the organic doctrine of the four ages, which can be found with a large degree of uniformity in different civilizations. According to tradition, the actual sense of history and the genesis of what I have labeled, generally speaking, as the modern world, results from a process of gradual decadence through four cycles or generations. The best known form of the doctrine of the four ages is that which was typical of the Greco-Roman tradition. He seed wrote about four eras symbolized by four metals, gold, silver, bronze, and iron, inserting between the last to a fifth era, the era of the heroes, which as we shall see, had only the meaning of a partial and special restoration of the primordial state. The Hindu tradition knows the same doctrine in the form of four cycles, called respectively Sati Yuga, Orkra Yuga, Tri Yuga, Dapar Yuga, and Kali Yuga, or Dark Age. Together with the simile of the failing during each of these, of one of the four hoofs or supports of the bull symbolizing Dharma, or the traditional law, the Persian version of this myth is similar to the Hellenic version. The four ages are known and characterized by gold, silver, steel, and an iron compound. The Chaldean version articulated this same view in almost identical terms. In particular, we can find a more recent simile of the chariot of the universe represented as a quadriga led by the supreme god. The quadriga is carried along a circular course by four horses representing the elements. The four ages were believed to correspond to the alternate predominance of each of these horses, which then leads the others according to the more or less luminous and rapid symbolic nature of the element that it represents. This view reappears, although in a special transposition, in the Hebrew tradition. In one of the prophetic writings mention is made of a very bright statue with the head made of gold, the chest and the arms of silver, the belly and the thighs of copper, the legs and the feet of iron and tile. This statue's four parts represent the four kingdoms that follow one another, beginning with the golden kingdom of the king of kings who has received dominion, strength, power, and glory from the god of heaven. If Egypt knew the tradition mentioned by Euvius concerning three distinct dynasties consisting respectively of gods, demigods, and manes, we can see in them the equivalent of the first three ages, golden, silver, and bronze. Likewise, the ancient Aztec traditions speak about five suns or solar cycles, the first four of which correspond to the elements and in which, as in the Eurasian traditions, one finds portrayed the catastrophes of fire, water, flood, and the struggles against giants characterizing the cycle of heroes that Hesiod added to the other four, and this we may recognize a variation of the same teaching, the memory of which may also be found more or less fragmentarily among other populations. Upon examining the meaning of each of these periods, it is opportune to anticipate some general considerations, since the above-mentioned view is an open contrast with the modern views concerning prehistory and the primordial world, to uphold with tradition that in the beginning there were no animal like gave, but rather more than human beings, and that in ancient prehistory there was no civilization but an ear of the gods, this to many people, who in one way or another believe in the gospel of Darwinism, amounts to pure and simple mythology. Since I have not invented this mythology myself, however, critics still have to explain its existence, that is, the fact that according to the most ancient testimonies and writings there is no memory that may lend support to evolutionism. What is found in them instead is the opposite, in other words, the recurrent idea of a better, brighter, and superhuman divine past. These same testimonies also know very little about animal origins, constant mention is made rather of the original relationship between men and deities, and a memory is kept alive of a primordial state of immortality together with the idea that the law of death appeared at one particular moment, almost as in a natural fact or as an anathema. Into characteristic testimonies, the cause of the fall was identified with the mixing of the divine race with the human race, which was regarded as inferior. In some texts that sin is compared to sodomy and sexual mating with animals. 
On the one hand, there is the biblical myth of the Benelum, the children of the gods who mated with the daughters of men, with the consequence that in the end, all mortals led depraved lives on earth. On the other hand, there is the Platonic myth of the inhabitants of Atlantis, conceived as the descendants and disciples of the gods, who lost the divine element and eventually allowed their human nature to become predominant because of the repeated intermingling with human beings. Its tradition, in more recent years, developed a variety of myths referring to races as bearers of civilization and to the struggles between divine races and animal, cyclopic, or demonic races. They are the Esses against the Elementaries and the Olympians and the heroes against giants and monsters of the darkness, the water, and the earth. They are the Irian Deva fighting against the Yasso, the enemies of the divine heroes. They are the Incas, the Dominus who impose their solar laws on the Aborigines who worshipped Mother Earth. They are the Tatha Daedon, who, according to Irish legends, overcame the dreadful race of the farmers and so on. On this basis, it can be argued that even though the traditional teaching retains the memory of the existence of stocks that could even correspond to the animalistic and inferior types described in the theory of evolution, this was the substratum predating the civilizations created by superior races. Evolutionism mistakenly considers these animal-like stocks to be absolutely primordial, while they are so only relatively. Another mistake of evolutionism is to conceive of some forms of mised that presuppose the emergence of other races that are superior either as civilizations and biological specimens or as products of evolution. These races had their own origins. Because so much time has elapsed, as in the case of the Hyperborean and the Atlantic races, and because of geophysical factors, these races have left very few traces of their existence and what remains is difficult to spot by those who are merely seeking archaeological and paleontological traces accessible to profane research. On the other hand, it is significant that populations that still live in the alleged original, primitive, and innocent state provide little comfort to the evolutionist hypothesis. These stocks, instead of falling, tend to become extinguished, thereby demonstrating themselves to be degenerate residues of cycles the vital potential of which has long since been exhausted. In other words, they are heterogeneous elements and remnants left behind by the mainstream of humanity. This was the case of the Neanderthal man, who in his extreme morphological brutishness closely resembles the ape man. Neanderthal man mysteriously disappeared in a given period in the races that followed, Orgnation man and especially Cro-Magnon man, and that represented a superior type, so much so that we can recognize in it the stock of several contemporary human races, cannot be considered further evolutionary stages of this vanished type. The same goes for the Grimaldi race, which also became extinct, and for the many primitive populations still in existence. They are not evolving, but rather becoming extinct. Their becoming civilized is not an evolution, but almost always represents a sudden mutation that affects their vital possibilities. There are species that retain their characteristics even in conditions that are relatively different from their natural ones. Other species in similar circumstances instead become extinct. Otherwise, what takes place is racial mixing with other elements in which no assimilation or real evolution occurs. The result of this interbreeding closely resembles the processes that follow Mendel's laws concerning heredity. Once it disappears in the phenotype, the primitive element survives in the form of a separated, latent heredity that is capable of cropping up in sporadic apparitions, even though it is always endowed with a character of heterogeneity in regard to the superior type. Evolutionists believe they are positively sticking to the facts. They ignore that the facts per se are silent, and that if interpreted in different ways they can lend support to the most incredible hypotheses. It has happened, however, that someone, though fully informed of all the data that are used to prove the theory of evolution, has shown these data to support the opposite thesis, which in more than one respect corresponds to the traditional teaching. I am referring to the thesis according to which man is not alone in being far from a product of the evolution of animal species, but many animal species must be considered as the offshoots or as the abortions of a primordial impulse. Only in the racially superior human species does this primordial impulse find its direct and adequate manifestation. There are also ancient myths about the struggle between divine races and monstrous entities or animal-like demons that allegedly took place before the advent of the human race, humanity at its early stage. These myths may refer to the struggle of the primordial human principle against its intrinsic animalistic potentialities, which were eventually isolated and left behind, so to speak, in the form of certain animal stocks. As far as the alleged ancestors of mankind, such as the anthropoid and the ice man, are concerned, they could represent the first casualties in the above-mentioned struggle or the best human elements that have been mixed together with or swept away by animal potentialities.
If in totemism, which is found in inferior societies, the notion of the mythical collective ancestor of the clan is often confused with that of the demon of a given animal species, this appears to reflect the memory of a similar stage of promiscuity. Although this is not the proper context to raise the issues related to anthropogenesis, which are to a certain degree of a transcendent nature, the absence of human fossils and the sole presence of animal fossils in remote prehistory may be interpreted to mean that primordial mankind, provided that we may call primordial man a type that would be very different from historical mankind, was the last form of life to undergo the process of materialization, which process has endowed the earlier, and unlike human species with an organism capable of being. We may recall here that in some traditions there is the memory of a primordial race characterized by weak or soft bones. For instance, Lizu, when talking about the Hyperborean region in which the present cycle began, mentioned that the inhabitants of this region have soft bones. In more recent times, the fact that superior races that came from the north did not bury but cremated their dead is just another factor that needs to be considered when facing the dilemma caused by the absence of pieces of bones. Somebody may object. There is no trace whatsoever of this fantastic mankind. Besides being somewhat naive to think that superior beings could not have existed without leaving behind traces such as ruins, utensils, weapons, and so on, it must be noted that in relatively recent eras there are residues of cyclopic works. Though not all of them are typical of a civilized society, the circle at Stonehenge, enormous stones put in a precarious and miraculous equilibrium, the Pedro Cansada in Peru, the Colossus of Tunic and the like. The archaeologists are baffled as to what means were employed just to gather and transport the necessary material. Going back in time, not only should we not conveniently forget what has already been admitted or at least not excluded a priori, that is, the existence of ancient lost lands and also that some lands were formed in recent geological eras, but we should also wonder whether it is fair to exclude a priori that a race in direct spiritual contact with cosmic forces ever existed, as tradition claims to be the case in the origins, just because it did not work on materials such as stone or metal, like those races that no longer have the means to act in accord with the power of the elements and beings. Rather, it seems to me that the caveman is itself a legend. It seems that primitive man did not employ caves, many of which betray a sacred orientation, as animal-like dwellings but as places of a cult that has remained in this form even in undoubtedly civilized eras, such as the Greek Minoan cult of caves and the ceremonies and the initiatory retreats on Mount Ida. It is only natural to find there in only traces, as a natural protection of the site, which in other sites the combined work of time, men, and the elements did not leave behind for our contemporaries. According to a very basic traditional idea, generally speaking, the state of knowledge and of civilization was the natural state, if not of mankind in general, at least of certain primordial elites. And knowledge was not constructed and acquired just as true kingship did not originate from below. Joseph de Mest, after remarking that what Rousseau and his epibones assumed to be the natural state, in reference to savages, is only the last stage of brutishness of some stocks that have either been scattered or suffered the consequences of some primordial act of degradation that affected their deepest substance, correctly pointed out, quote, As far as the development of science is concerned, we are blinded by gross misunderstanding, that is, to assume a judgmental attitude to those times in which men saw effects in the causes on the basis of times in which men with effort ascended from the effects to the causes, in which people only care about effects, in which it is said that it is useless to be concerned about causes, and in which people have forgotten what a cause really means, unquote. In the beginning mankind not only possessed a science, but quote, a very different science, which originated from above and was therefore very dangerous. This explains why in the beginning science was always mysterious and confined to the temples, in which it eventually became extinct when the only thing this flame could do was to burn." Unquote. Thus, another science was slowly formed as a surrogate, namely, the merely human and empirical science of which our contemporaries are so proud and through which they have thought fit to judge everything that they consider to be civilization. This science merely represents the futile attempt to climb back up, through surrogates, from an unnatural and degenerated state, what is most sad is that it is no longer even perceived to be such that did not characterize the origins at all. In any event, one must realize that these and similar indications will play a minimal role for those who are not determined to change their own frame of mind. Every epoch has its own myth through which it reflects a given collective climate. 
Today, the aristocratic idea that mankind has higher origins, namely, a past of light and of spirit, has been replaced by the democratic idea of evolutionism, which derives the higher from the lower, man from animal, civilization from barbarism. This is not so much the objective result of a free and conscious scientific inquiry, but rather one of the many reflections that the advent of the modern world, characterized by inferior social and spiritual strata and by man without traditions, has necessarily produced on the intellectual and cultural plane. Thus, we should not delude ourselves. Some positive superstitions will always produce alibis to defend themselves. The acknowledgement of new horizons will be possible not through the discovery of new findings, but rather through a new attitude toward these findings. Any attempt to validate even from a scientific perspective what the traditional dogmatic point of view upholds will generate results only among those who are already spiritually well disposed to accept this kind of knowledge. Chapter 23. The Golden Age. I will now engage in an ideal and morphological assessment of the cycles corresponding to the four traditional years. Further, and I will discuss their geographical and historical trid. First of all, the Golden Age, this year corresponds to an original civilization that was naturally and totally in conformity with what has been called the traditional spirit. For this reason, in both the location and the stock that the Golden Age is historically and metahistorically associated with, we find symbols and attributes that characterize the highest function of regality. Symbols of polarity, solarity, height, stability, glory, and life in a higher sense. In later epics and in particular traditions, which are already mixed and scattered, the dominating, in a traditional sense, elites effectively appeared as those who still enjoy to reproduce the state of being of the origins. This allows us, through a shift from the derivative to the integral, so to speak, to deduce also from the titles and the attributes of those dominating straight of society some elements that may help us to characterize the nature of the first era. The first era is essentially the era of being, and hence of truth in a transcendent sense. This is evident not only from the Hindu designation of Sadiyu, Sat means being, hence Sadiyu or truth, but also from the Latin name Saturn, who is the king or god of the Golden Age. Saturn, who corresponds to the Hellenic Kronos, is a subtle reference to this idea, since in his name we find the Aryan root Sat, being, together with the attributive ending Ris as in Nocturnus. As far as the era of being or of spiritual stability is concerned, we shall see below that in several representations of the primordial site in which this cycle unfolded it is possible to find the symbols of terra firma surrounded by waters, or of the island, the mountain, or the middle land. As the age of being the first era is also the year of the living in the eminent sense of the word. According to Hesiod, death, which for most people is truly an end that bequeath Hades, made its appearance only during the last ages, the Iron and Bronze Ages. During Kronos' golden age, mortal people lived as if they were gods, Isis Tithia, and no miserable old age came their way. That cycle ended, but those men continued to live upon the earth, Tumen Aizi, in an invisible way, mantling themselves in dark mist and watching Erisimen e over mortal men. These words allude to the previously mentioned doctrine according to which the representatives of the primordial tradition, as well as their original site, disappeared. In the realm of Yama, the Persian king of the Golden Age, before the new cosmic events forced him to withdraw into a subterranean refuge, the inhabitants of which were thus enabled to evade the dark and painful destiny befallen the new generations, there was neither disease nor death. Yam, the brilliant, the most glorious of those yet to be born, the sun-like one of men, banished death from his kingdom. Just as in Saturn's golden kingdom, according to both Romans and Greeks, men and immortal gods shared one common life. The rulers of the first of the mythical Egyptian dynasties were called the gods or divine beings. According to a Chaldean myth, death reigns universally only in the post-Diluvian era, in which the gods left death to men while keeping eternal life for themselves. Bernambio, the land of the living, and Trinanog, the land of youth, are the names in the Celtic traditions of an island or a mysterious Atlantic land the Druids believed to be the birthplace of mankind. In the Saga Ia of Kalnosurik, where this land is identified with the land of the victorious one, Trinabodog, it is called the land of the living, in which there is no death or old age. Moreover, the relationship that the first era always has with gold symbolizes what is incorruptible, solar, luminous, and bright, in the Hellenic tradition, gold had a relationship with the radiant splendor of light and with everything that is sacred and great. Thus, anything that was bright, radiant, and beautiful was designated as golden. 
In the Vedic tradition, the primordial germ, Hirnigarbo, was golden. It was also said, for golden deed is fire, light, and immortality. In the Egyptian tradition, the king was believed to be made of gold or of the same solar fluid the incorruptible body of the heavenly gods and the immortals was made of, so much so that the title golden applied to the king, Horus made of gold, and designated his divine and solar origin, his incorruptibility and indestructibility. From the golden top of Mount Mir, which was considered to be a pole, the original homeland of mankind, and the Olympian seat of the gods, and from the golden top of the ancient Oscar, which was believed to be the seat of the Esses and of the divine Nordic kings located in the middle abode. To the pure land, Qingtiyu, and to equivalent locations portrayed in Chinese traditions. Time and time again we find the concept of the original cycle in which the spiritual quality symbolized by gold had its definitive and most eminent manifestation. We may also assume that in several myths that mention the deposit or the transmission of some golden object, references being made to the deposit or transmission of something closely related to the primordial tradition. According to the Yeti myth immediately following the Ragnaraka, the twilight of the gods, a new race and a new sun will arise, then the Essos will be brought together again, and they will discover the mysterious golden tablets that they possessed in the time of the origins. Equivalent ideas or further explicitations of the golden symbol during the first era are light, splendor, and the glory, in that specific triumphal meaning that I already explained when discussing the concept of the Mycenae Trino. According to the Persian tradition, the primordial land, Aryan of Ego, inhabited by the seed of the Aryan race and by Yuma himself, who was called the Glorious and the Radiant One, was regarded as the first of the good lands and countries created by Ahura Mazda. According to an equivalent figuration found in the Hindu tradition, the Suited Vipa, the white island or continent situated in the north, just like Iceland, the northern primordial seat of the Aztecs, which implies the idea of whiteness or brightness, is the place of Tejas, of a radiant force, and inhabited by the divine Narayana, who is regarded as the light or as he in whom a great fire shines, radiating in every direction. The Thule mentioned by the Greeks was characterized as the land of the sun. Someone said, the ultimate soul no hybens. Though the etymology of the word Thule is obscure and uncertain, it still signifies the idea the ancients had concerning this divine region and it points to the sore character of the ancient Lapalan, Tullin, or Tul, a contraction of Twinland, the place of the sun, the original homeland of the Tultecs and the paradise of their heroes. It also points to the home of the Hyperboreans, since according to the sacred geography of ancient traditions, the Hyperboreans were a mysterious race that lived in eternal light and whose region was believed to be the dwelling place in the homeland of the Delphi Kapala, who was the Doric god of light, Fibavaplin, the pure and the radiant one, who was also represented as a golden god and as a god of the golden age. There were stocks like the Boreas that were simultaneously priestly and kingly and who derived their dignity from the Apollonian land of the Hyperboreans. Here to there are plenty of references that can be cited. Cycle of being, solar cycle, cycle of light is glory, cycle of the living in an eminent and transcendent sense. These are the characteristics of the first age, the golden age, or the ear of the gods found in the traditional memories. Chapter 24 the Pole in the Hyperborean region. At this time, it is important to consider a peculiar characteristic of the primordial age that allows us to associate with it very specific historical and geographical representations. I have previously discussed the symbolism of the pole. This pole is either represented as an island or as terra firma and symbolizes spiritual stability, the seat of transcendent beings, heroes, and immortals, opposed to the contingency of the waters, or as a mountain or elevated place usually associated with Olympian meanings. In ancient traditions, both of these representations were often associated with the polar symbolism that was applied to the supreme center of the world and thus to the archetype of any kind of regera in the supreme sense of the word. In addition to the symbol of the pole, there are some recurrent and very specific traditional data that indicate the north as the site of an island, terra firma, or mountain, the meaning of which is often confused with the location of the first ear. In other words, we are confronted by a motif that simultaneously has a spiritual and a real meaning, pointing back to a time when the symbol was reality and the reality a symbol in history and matasur are not to separated parts but rather to parts reflecting each other. This is precisely the point in which it is possible to enter into the events conditioned by time. 
Allegedly, according to tradition, in an epoch of remote prehistory that corresponds to the Golden Age origin of being, the Symbolica Island or Polar Land was a real location situated in the Arctic, in the area that today corresponds to the North Pole. This region was inhabited by beings who by virtue of their possession of that non-human spirituality, characterized by gold, glory, light, and life, that in later times will be evoked by the above-mentioned symbolism, founded the race that exemplified the reigning tradition in a pure state. This race, in turn, was the central and most direct source of the various forms and manifestations this tradition produced in other races and civilizations. The memory of this Arctic seed is the heritage of the traditions of many people, both in the form of real geographical references and in symbols of its function and its original meaning. These symbols were often elevated to a superhistorical plane. In other words, they were applied to other centers that were capable of being considered as replicas of the former. For this reason, there is often a confusion of memories, names, myths, and locations, but a trained eye will easily detect the single components. It is noteworthy to emphasize the interference of the Arctic theme with the land theme, of the mystery of the North with the mystery of the West, since the latter succeeded the original traditional pole as the main seat. We know that owing to an astrophysical cause, that is, to the tilting of the terrestrial axis, in every year there has been a change in climate. According to tradition, this inclination occurred at the specific moment in which the Sydney of a physical and a metaphysical event occurred, as if to represent a state of disorder in the natural world that reflected an event of a spiritual nature. When Lizu described the myth of the giant Kung Kung who shatters the column of heaven, he was probably referring to such an event. In this Chinese tradition, we also find other concrete references, such as the following one, though it is mixed together with details that describe later cataclysms. Quote, the pillars of heaven were shattered. The earth shook at its foundations. The northern skies descended lower and lower. The sun, the moon, and the stars changed their course. The course appeared changed as a result of the tilting of the terrestrial axis. The earth's surface cracked and the waters contained in its belly gushed forward and inundated various countries. Man was in a state of rebellion against heaven and the universe fell victim to chaos. The sun darkened. The planets changed their course because of the above-mentioned shift in perspective and the great harmony of heaven was destroyed. Unquote. In any event, the freezing in the long night descended at a specific time on the polar region. As so when the forced migration from the seed ensued, the first cycle came to an end and a new cycle, the Atlantic cycle, began. Airy texts from India, such as the Vedas and the Mahabharata, preserve the memory of the Arctic Sea through astronomical and calendar-related allusions that cannot be understood other than through an actual reference to such a seat. In the Hindu tradition, the term Dupi, which means insular continent, is often used to designate different cycles by virtue of a spatial transposition of a temporal notion, cycle island. Now, in the doctrine of the Dvipa, we find meaningful recollections of the Arctic seat, even though they are mixed with other things. The above-mentioned Sveti Dvipa, Island of Splendor, was situated in the far north. The Tarkur are often mentioned as an original northern race that originated from Jammu Dvipa, the polar insular continent that is the first of the various Dvipa and, at the same time, the center of them all. Its memory is mixed with the memory of the Saka Dvipa, located in the White Sea or Milky Sea, namely, the Arctic Sea. In this place, no deviation from the law from above occurred. According to the Kuma Purana, the seat of the solar Vishu, symbolized by the polar cross, the hooked cross or swastika, coincides with the Svidvipa that the Padma Purana claims to be the homeland, located beyond anything connected with Samsric fear and fret, of the great Sadiks, the Mahyuji, and the children of Brahman, the equivalent of the transcendent beings who inhabited the northern regions, according to the Chinese tradition. These great souls live by Hari, who is Vishnu himself, represented as blonde and golden and living by a symbolic throne, upheld by lions, which shines like the sun and radiates like fire. These are variations on the theme of the land of the sun. As a reflection of this, on a doctrinal plane the Devayana, which is the way leading to solar immortality and to super-individual states of being, as opposed to the way or return to the Mani or to the mothers, was called the way of the north, in Sanskrit, north, Tar also means the most elevated or supreme region. Also, Tariyana, northern path, is the ascending path followed by the sun between the winter and summer solstices. Among the Aryans from Iran we find more precise memories. Their original seat, Aryan of Agua, created by the god of light and in which the glory dwells and where the king Yumel allegedly met a was a land situated in the far north. 
The tradition of the Zend Avesta relates that Yemos warned in advance of the approaching of fatal winters and that the serpent of winter, the pet of the god of darkness, Ingramenu, came upon Arian of Eagle. Then, there were ten months of winter and two of summer, and it was cold in the waters, on the earth, and frost covered the vegetation. Ten months of winter and two months of summer. This is the climate of the Arctic regions. The Nordic Scandinavian tradition, notwithstanding its fragmentary nature, offers various testimonies that are often mixed together in a confused way. It is possible, however, to find analogous testimonies. The Asgard, the primordial golden seed of the Esses, was located by those traditions in the MIT Guard, which was the land in the middle. This mythical land was in turn identified both with the Broderick, which is a semi-Arctic region, and with the Green Island or Greenland, which, the portrayed in ancient cosmology as the first land to arise from the Ibis Genugigip, is likely to be related with Greenland itself, Greenland, as the name itself suggests, seems to have had a rich vegetation and to have been unaffected by the Isage up to the time of the Goths. In the early Middle Ages we still find the idea that the northern regions were the original birthplace of all races and people. Moreover, in the Eddie tales describing the struggle of the gods against destiny, rock, an eschatological struggle that they believed is going to affect their own homeland, it is possible to recognize some data that refer to the end of the first cycle. In these tales, reminiscences of past events are mixed with occultical themes. Here, just like in the Vendidead, we find the theme of a terrible winter. The breaking out of the natural elements was coupled with the dimming of the sun. According to the Gilfogening, first of all winter will come called Fimble Winter Mighty or Mysterious Winter. Then snow will drift from all directions. There will be great frosts and keen winds. In the Chinese tradition the country of transcendent men and the country of a race of beings with soft bones are often identified with the northern region. An emperor of the First Dynasty was thought to have resided in a country located north of the northern sea, in a boundless region spared by inclement weather and endowed with a symbolic mountain, Huling, and a water spring. This country was called Far North, Mu, another imperial type, was said to have been broke upon leaving it. Analogously, Tibet retains the memory of Changshampal, the mystical northern city, or city of peace, also thought to be the island on which the hero Gezer was said to have been born, just like Zarathustra was born in the area of Ego. The masters of Tibetan tradition say that the northern paths led the Yogun to the great liberation. The recurrent tradition concerning the origins that is found in North America, from the Pacific to the region of the Great Lakes, mentions the sacred land of the far north, situated by the Great Waters, Whence allegedly came the ancestors of the Netherlands, the Toltecs, and the Aztecs, I previously mentioned that the name of this land, Iceline, just like the Hindu seated view, denotes the idea of whiteness or of white land. In the northern traditions there is the memory of a land inhabited by Gallic races and situated by the Gulf of St. Lawrence called Great Ireland or Vitramond, which means homeland of white people. The names Wamaki and Pinaki found among the inhabitants of those regions derive from the word Wabayu, which means white. Furthermore, some legends of Central America mention four primordial ancestors of the Quiche race who are trying to return to Tala, the region of light. When they get there they only find ice. Also, the sun seldom appears. Then they scatter and move to the country of the Quiche. This Tula or Talon was the original homeland of the Toltec's forefathers, who probably derived their tribal name from it and who eventually called Tula the center of the empire they established on the Mexican plateau. This Tula was also conceived as the land of the sun and was sometimes located east of North America, in the Atlantic. But this is probably due to the interference of the memory of a later location that was destined to perpetuate for some time the function of the primordial Tula to which Iceland probably corresponds, when the glacial weather descended upon it and when the sun disappeared. The name Tool, which visibly corresponds to the Greek Slul, was also applied to other regions. According to Greco-Roman traditions, the lay in the sea that derives its name from the god of the Golden Age, namely, the Cronium Sea, which corresponds to the northern region of the Atlantic. A similar location was ascribed in later traditions to what became symbol and mattestry in the form of the Happy Islands, or the Islands of the Immortals, or the Lost Island. This island, as Arniasagas Adventus wrote, is hidden from people's sight. Sometimes it is discovered by chance, but when it is actively sought after, it cannot be found. Thule is confused with both the legendary Hyperborean of Homeland, situated in the far north and from which the original Achean stocks brought the Delphic Apollo, and with the Alva Gigi, the sea's navel located far away in the vast ocean. 
Pudok situated this island north of Great Britain and claimed that it was in proximity of the Arctic region where Kronos, the god of the Golden Region, is still asleep. In this location the sun sets only for one hour each day, and even then the darkness is not all enveloping but looks more like a twilight, just like in the Arctic regions. The confused notion of the bright northern night became the foundation of the notion of the land of the Hyperboreans as a place of perennial light, free of darkness. This representation and this memory were so vivid that an echo of it lasted until the end of the Roman civilization. After the primordial land was identified with Great Britain, it is said that the Constantius Chlorus, reigned AD 305-306, went there with his legions not so much to pursue trophies and military victories, but rather in order to visit the land that is most sacred and closest to heaven, to be able to contemplate the father of the gods, Kronos, and to enjoy it without a night, in other words, to be able to anticipate the possession of the eternal light that is typical of imperial apotheosis. Even when the Golden Age was projected into the future as the hope of a new cyclum, we can still find references to Nordic symbolism. According to Lactantes, the mighty prince who will re-establish justice after the fall of Rome will come from the north. Ab extremis finibus plagae septentrionalis, the mystical and invincible Tibetan hero Gezer, who will re-establish a kingdom of justice and exterminate the usurpers, is expected to be reborn in the north, and Baal, the sacred northern city, will be the birthplace of Kalki Avodar, the one who will put an end to the Dark Age, the Hyperborean Apollo, according to Virgil, will inaugurate a new golden and heroic age in the sign of Rome, and so on. After stating these essential points, I will not make further references to the law that connects physical and spiritual causes as it is applied to a plane upon which, between what may be characterized as a fall, the deviation of an absolutely primordial race, and the physical tilting of the terrestrial axis, which determined radical changes in climate and periodical natural disasters affecting entire continents, it is possible to have a foreboding of an intimate connection. I will only point out that ever since the polar seed became deserted it is possible to verify the progress of alteration and loss of the original tradition that will eventually lead to the Iron Age, or Dark Age, or Kali Yuga, or Era of the Wolf, Edda, and, strictly speaking, to modern times. Chapter 25 The Northern Atlantic Cycle as far as the migration of the northern primordial race is concerned, it is necessary to distinguish the great waves, the first moving from north to south, the second from west to east, groups of Hyperboreans carrying the same spirit, the same blood, and the same body of symbols, signs, and languages first reached North America and the northern regions of the Eurasian continent. Supposedly, tens of thousands of years later a second great migratory wave ventured as far as Central America, reaching a land situated in the Atlantic region that is now lost, thereby establishing a new center modeled after the polar regions. This land may have been that Atlantis described by Plato and Diodorus. The migration and the reestablishment of a center helped to explain the transpositions of names, symbols, and topographies that I have discussed in reference to the first ages. In regard to this, it is fitting to talk about a northern Atlantic people and civilization. From this Atlantic seat the races of the second cycle spread to the American, hence the previously mentioned memories of the Neulans, Toltecs, and Aztecs concerning their original homeland, European, and African continents. Most likely these races reached the borders of Western Europe in the early Paleolithic. These races supposedly corresponded to, among others, the Tatha de Don, the divine stock that came to Ireland from Avalon and who were led by a green Inuit, the hero with a sunny countenance, whose counterpart is the white and solar Quetzalcoatl, who came with his companions to America from the land situated beyond the waters. Anthropologically speaking, these races correspond to cro man who made his appearance toward the end of the glacial age in the western part of Europe, especially in the area of the French Cantabric civilization of Abrilaw Badalin, Gordon, and Altamira, cro man was clearly superior, both culturally and biologically, to the aboriginal Mysterian man of the Ice Age, so much so that somebody recently nicknamed the cro the Greeks of the Paleolithic. As far as their origin is concerned, the similarity between their civilization and the civilization of the Hyperborean, which is found even in the vestiges of the people of the Far North civilization of the reindeer, is very significant. Among other prehistoric traces of the same cycle are those found on the Baltic and Frisian Saxon shores, in the Dogland, in a region that has partly disappeared, the legendary Veneta, a center of this civilization was eventually established. Besides Spain, other migratory waves landed on West African shores, later on, 
between the Paleolithic and the Neolithic and probably in conjunction with races of direct northern descent. Other people moved through the continents from northwest to southeast toward Asia, into the area many believe to be the cradle of the Indo-European race, and then further on, all the way to China. Other ways followed the North African shoreline all the way to Egypt or went by sea from the Balearic Islands to Sardinia and to the prehistoric sites in the Aegean Sea, more particularly in Europe and in the Near East, the origin of the megalithic civilization of the Dolmen and the so-called Battleaxe people, which remains as enigmatic as that of Cro-Magnon, is very similar. This migration occurred in separate ways, through fluxes and refluxes, interbreeding, and conflicts with aboriginal or already mixed races. Thus, from north to south and from west to east, through diffusion, adaptation, or domination, there arose civilizations that originally shared, to a certain degree, the same matrix, and often strains of the same spiritual legacy found in the conquering elites. Encounters with inferior races, which were enslaved to the thonic cult of demons and mixed with the animal nature, generated memories of struggles that were eventually expressed in mythologized forms that always underline the contrast between a bright, divine type, an element of northern origins, and a dark, demonic type. Through the institution of traditional societies by the conquering races, a hierarchy was established that carried a spiritual, ethnic, and racial value. In India, in Iran, in Egypt, and even in Peru, we find rather evident traces of this in the institution of the caste system. I have said that originally the Atlantic center was supposed to reproduce the polar function of the Hyperborean seat and that the second center occasioned frequent confusion in traditions and in memories. This confusion should not prevent us from detecting in a later period, yet still falling within remote prehistory, a transformation of civilization and spirituality in a differentiation leading from the first to the second year, from the Golden Age to the Silver Age that eventually prepared the way for the third year, the Bronze Age or Titanic Age. This it should be characterized as the Age of Atlantis, considering that the Hellenic tradition regarded Atlas as related to the Titans by virtue of being Prometheus' brother. Now, anthropologically speaking, we must consider a first major group that became differentiated through a variation, or variation without mixing. This group was mainly composed of the migratory waves of a more immediate Arctic derivation and it made its last appearance in the various strains of the Pure race. A second large group became differentiated through Meset with the aboriginal southern races, with proto-mongoloid and negoid races, and with other races that probably represented the degenerated residues of the inhabitants of a second prehistoric continent, now lost, which was located in the south, and which some designated as Lemuria. The second group includes the red-skinned race of the last inhabitants of Atlantis, according to Plato's mythical account, those who forfeited their pristine, divine nature because of repeated unions with the human race. These people should be regarded as the original ethic stock of several new civilizations established by the migratory waves from west to east, the red race of Cretan Aegeans, Hagrites, Polician, Lycians, Egyptians, Kefti, etc., and of the American civilizations. These latter people in their myth remembered the country of origin of their ancestors who had come from the divine Atlantic land, situated on the Great Waters. The name Phoenicians means the Red Ones, and most likely is another memory of the first Atlantic navigators of the Neolithic Mediterranean. Two components must be considered both from an anthropological and from a spiritual point of view, the northern and the Atlantic components, in the vast material concerning traditions and institutions found in the second cycle. The first component is immediately related to the light of the north, and it retained for the most part the original Iranian and polar orientation. The second component reveals the transformation that occurred as a result of the contacts established with the southern populations. Before considering the meaning of such a transformation, which constitutes the first alteration or, so to speak, the inner counterpart of the loss of the polar residents, it is necessary to emphasize another point. Almost every people retains the memory of a catastrophe that ended the previous cycle of mankind. The myth of the flood is the most frequent form employed to describe this memory. It is shared by many people, from the Persians and Mexicans to the Mays, from the Chaldeans and Greeks to the Hindus and to the people who inhabited the Atlantic African coastline, to the Celts and to the Scandinavian people. Moreover, its original content is a historical event. According to the tale of Plato and Diodorus, it essentially represented the end of an Atlantic land, the center of the Atlantic civilization, to which its colonies were subordinated for a long time, sank into the sea in an era that by far predates the time that, according to Hindu tradition, inaugurated the Dark Age, according to some traces of chronology built into the myth. This is what indeed happened.
The historical memory of that center gradually disappeared in the civilizations that derived from it but in which elements of the ancient heritage were retained in the blood of the dominating caste. The roots of various languages, and also in social institutions, signs, rituals, and hierams. In the Hebrew tradition, the theme of the Tower of Babel, with the ensuing punishment represented by the confusion of the various languages, Genesis 11:7, may refer to the period in which the unitary tradition was lost and the various forms of civilization were dissociated from their common origin and could no longer understand each other after the catastrophe of the flood ended the cycle of Atlantic mankind. The historical memory was often preserved in myth, that is, in metatistry. The West, in which Atlantis was located during its original cycle, when it reproduced and perpetuated the much older polar function, very often represented a nostalgic reference point for the fallen ones. By virtue of transposition onto a different plane, the waters that submerged the Atlantic land were called waters of death, which the following post diluvian generations, consisting entirely of mortal beings, must cross for initiation in order to be reintegrated with the divine state of the dead, namely, with the lost race. On this basis, the well-known figurations of the island of the dead could be understood in a similar sense as transformations of the memory of the sunken insular continent. The mystery of paradise and of places of immortality in general was reconnected with the mystery of the west and in some instances of the north too, and thus it formed a body of traditional teachings the same way the theme of those who are rescued from the waters and of those who do not drown in the waters shifted from the real historical sense that referred to the elites who escaped the catastrophe and went on to establish new traditional centers to a symbolic meaning and appeared in the legends of prophets, heroes, and initiates. Generally speaking, the symbols proper to that primordial race surface again in enigmatic ways until relatively recent times, wherever traditional conquering kings and dynasties made their appearance. Moreover, the Greeks often discussed the exact spot of the divine garden, Thinkipos, which was the original dwelling of the Olympian god Zeus, and of the garden of the Hesperides, beyond the river ocean, according to some, the Hesperides were the daughters of Atlas, the king of the western island. It was precisely this garden that Heracles was supposed to find in that symbolic feat that has often been associated with his winning Olympian immortality, and having had Atlas as a guide who alone knows the dark depths of the sea. Generally speaking, the Hellenic equivalent of the northern, solar way or of the Indo-Aryan Deviana was a western path or Zeus way, which led from the fortress of Kronos, located in the island of the heroes on the faraway sea, to the peaks of Mount Olympus. According to the Chaldean tradition, it is in the west, beyond the deep waters of death, which have no ford and which have not been crossed for the longest time that the divine garden is to be found, in which the king Shamachapachim, the hero who escaped the flood and who still retains the privilege of immortality, still reigns. This garden was reached by Gilgamesh who followed the western path of the sun in order to receive the gift of life. It is significant that the Egyptian civilization did not have a barbaric prehistory. It arose all of a sudden, so to speak, enjoying from the start a high level of sophistication. According to tradition, the first Egyptian dynasties were formed by a race that had come from the west, also known as the race of Horus companions, Shemsuhiro, or of those marked by the sign of the first among the inhabitants of the western land, namely Osiris. Osiris himself was believed to be the eternal king on Iala's fields, in the land of the sacred Amentet, beyond the waters of death, which was thought to exist in the far west, and which sometimes has been associated with the idea of a great insular land. The Egyptian funerary rite carried on the symbolism in the ancient memory, in this rite the ritual formula was to the west and it included the crossing of the waters in a procession carrying the sacred Ark of the Sun, that is, the Ark of those who had been rescued from the waters. Moreover, the Chinese and Tibetan traditions mention the existence of a western paradise with trees bearing golden fruits, like the Hesperides Garden. There is also a frequent image of Mitu with the rope and the inscription, He who draws the souls to the west. On the other hand, the memory that was transformed into the myth of paradise is also found in Celtic and Gallic sagas concerning the land of the living, the Mogmel, the Pleasant Plain, or Avalon, which were other only regions located in western lands. Avalon was believed to be the place in which the survivors of the race from above of the Tatha de Don, King Arthur himself, legendary heroes such as Conan, Oisin, Cucullin, Ligor, Obi the Dane, and others came to enjoy eternal life. This mysterious Avalon is the equivalent of the Atlantic paradise described in American legends. 
It is the ancient Lapalan or Talon. It is the land of the sun, or the red land to which both the white god Quetzalcoatl and legendary heroes such as the Twiltic priest Humak Great Hand, mentioned in the Codex Chimapapakai, returned, as did the Tatha to Avalon, thus disappearing from people's sight. According to Jewish folklore, Enoch went to a western place, to the far end of the earth, in which there are symbolic mountains and divine trees guarded by the archangel Michael. These trees give life and salvation to the elect of our bard to mere morals until the time of the Last Judgment. The last echoes of this myth were kept secret until the Christian Middle Ages. The navigator monks of the monasteries of St. Matthias and of St. Tablius allegedly found in a mysterious Atlantic land a golden city, which was believed to be the dwelling place of Enoch and Elijah, the prophets, who never died. On the other hand, in the myth of the flood, the disappearance of the sacred land separated from continental land by Amer Tenebrisum, the waters of death, may also assume a meaning that connects it to the symbolism of the Ark, to the preservation of the germs of the living, the living in an eminent and figurative sense. The disappearance of the legendary sacred land may also signify the passage of the center, which retains in an unadulterated way the primordial non-human spirituality, into the invisible, the cult, or the unmanifested. Hence, according to Hesiod, the beings of the First Age, who never died, would continue to exist as humankind's invisible guardians. The legend of the subterranean people or of the subterranean kingdom is often the counterpart of the legend of a sunken land, island, or city. This legend is found among several populations. When Empire began to run rampant on the earth, the survivors of previous years moved to an underground location. In other words, they acquired an invisible existence that is often situated in the mountains as a result of transpositions with the symbolism of the heights. These beings continue to exist on those mountain peaks until new manifestation is made possible for them as the end of the cycle of decadence approaches. Ender said that the road leading to the Hyperboreans can be found neither by ship nor by marching feet and that only heroes such as Perseus and Heracles were admitted to it. Montezuma, the last Mexican emperor, may enter Iceland only after performing magical operations and undergoing a transformation of his physical body. Plutarch relates that the inhabitants of northern regions could commune with Kronos, the king of the Golden Age, and with the inhabitants of the far northern region only in their sleep. According to Lizu, those marvelous regions he mentions that are connected to the Arctic and the Atlantic seat, you cannot reach by boat or carriage or on foot, only by a journey of the spirit. According to the Tibetan Lama's teachings, Shampala, the mystical northern seat, is within everyone. This is how the testimonies concerning what once was a real location inhabited by non-human beings survived and assumed a metahistorical value, providing at the same time symbols of states beyond ordinary life that can only be reached through initiation. Besides the symbol, we find the idea that the original center still exists in an occult and usually unreachable location, similar to what Catholic theology said about the Garden of Eden. Only a change of state or of nature can open its doors to the generations living in the last ages. This is how the second great transposition of metaphysics and history is established. In reality, the symbol of the West, just like that of the Pole, may acquire a universal value beyond all geographical and historical references. In the West, where the physical light that is subject to birth and to decline becomes extinguished, the unchanging spiritual light is kindled. There the journey of the sunship toward the land of the immortals commences. And since this region lies where the sun disappears beyond the horizon, it was also conceived as subterranean or as underwater, this is straightforward symbolism directly inspired by natural observations and thus used by various populations, even by those that have no relation with Atlantic memories. This, however, does not mean that such a theme, situated within given limits determined by concomitant testimonies such as the ones I have presented, may not also have a historical character. What I mean is that among the countless forms assumed by the mystery of the West, a group may be isolated for which it is legitimate to assume that the origin of the symbol did not consist in the natural phenomenon of the course of the sun, but rather, by virtue of a spiritual transposition, in the distant memory of the disappeared Western land. In this regard, the surprising correspondence between American and European myths, especially Nordic and Celtic ones, constitutes a very decisive proof. Secondly, the mystery of the West always marks a particular stage in the history of the spirit that is no longer the primordial one. It corresponds to a type of spirituality that cannot be considered to be primordial and therefore it is defined by the mystery of transformation. It is characterized by a dualism and by a discontinuous passage. A light is kindled, another fades away. Transcendence has gone underground. 
Supernature, unlike the original state, is no longer nature. It is the goal of an initiation and the object of a problematic quest. Even when considered in its general aspect, the mystery of the West appears to be typical of those more recent civilizations, the varieties and destinies of which I will examine in the next chapter. It is connected to the solar symbolism rather than to the polar one. We have now entered the second phase of the primordial tradition.